here tonight. We are coming out from Bible study. Somebody say yeah. Let me get the word of God. Thank you for joining us tonight, Shiloh Baptist Church. There is a word from the Lord. We're starting a three-week series on something that is going to take you far in the next few I would say the next few months of your life, if you take this and grab it, we're talking about why would God allow us to go through the wilderness? And I know I'm not the only one in here that's been through a wilderness experience, and that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to explain to you what the wilderness is. I'm going to explain to you why God has allowed things that are happening in your life to be happening in your life. So right now, uh, we're going to go into a word of prayer, and let's pray. And let's pray right now. Father God, I thank you for another night. Thank you for those that are joining us virtually. Thank you for those that are here. Father, we're going to continue. Let the kingdom excite us. We're going to continue to move on and get a blessing from what you're doing in our life. I ask you right now, Father, send down your anointing on this place. Let somebody sitting home, let someone sitting in here know, Lord, that this word was designed exactly for them. We thank you for that now, God. Ask for your blessing and ask that you would let your anointing take over and have its way in this place. Amen. I'm excited about this teaching, and you should be too. So I want you to go with me quickly in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. Go to Matthew chapter 4. You have a handout. Um, you grab, grab a pen, take some notes, and get this. As I said, this is a three-week study, but you'll get, you got a handout. And we're going to talk about something that has been puzzling a lot of folk, and that why in the world does it look like my life is always in the wilderness? We're going to explain to you what a wilderness is. We're going to explain to you what God is doing and how you can get out. I know somebody wants to get out of the wilderness Amen. and make a better life. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So Matthew chapter 4, very familiar, but I want you to hear something because there are three words that's going to trigger our study tonight. So look at your text. I want you to see it. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Stop right there. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And watch this. And he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was hungry. Now somebody check this. Why would God send Jesus into the wilderness? Why would God send his son that had come down to be our sin bearer, to bless us, to walk in the calling of redemption? Why would God take Jesus and send him to the wilderness? Jesus hadn't done anything except what God had said. As a matter of fact, in chapter 3, he had just been baptized. And God confirmed that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So I need somebody to know the first thing you need to understand about the wilderness. It does not mean you are out of line with God's will because you're in the wilderness. Amen. It does not mean that you're not doing what God is saying. It does not mean that some people think my sins have caught up with me. It don't mean that. When you're in the wilderness, you got to look at this example. I need you to understand our title is Why Would God Sin us to the wilderness and I started with why would God send Jesus to the wilderness so you understand from the text he was led up by the spirit that means God the triune God God the Father God the Holy Ghost God the, God the Son the Holy Ghost God led Jesus into the spirit in by the spirit into the wilderness stop I want to make it plain to somebody else you need to understand what the wilderness is. When I share with you what this text really means, you're going to see the prosperity and the blessing of your life going in the direction of the wilderness. So first, let's answer the question, why would God send Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted of Satan? So first of all, this teaching is to teach you how to thank God, may sound strange, for your wilderness experiences. 
I'm going to teach you tonight how to thank God. I'm going to have you shouting about stuff ain't going right in your life. I'm going to have you shouting about what things are happening to you. And God is going to teach you that wilderness experience is so important to where you're going in God that it's going to be the quintessential foundation of your next level in God. So follow this. Look what he said. The wilderness experience, I want to teach you how to thank God for the wilderness experience. I didn't tell you to thank God in the wilderness experience. That should be a no brainer. That's normal. You ought to learn how to thank God in the wilderness experience. As a matter of fact, how many people know I can't even survive if I don't thank God when I'm in the wilderness experience? God is the only thing I, I, I can call on and believe for. So somebody out there, if you don't understand that, the first thing you got to realize is, I, I hope I don't have to teach that. You better keep on praising while you're in the wilderness. You, you better keep on trusting God while you're in the wilderness. Come on, you already know the verses. Uh, Psalms 34 and 1. Uh, I will bless the Lord at how many times? All times. His praise shall continually be my that's covering it. So you can't go into a funk and get down when you're in the wilderness if you keep a praise in your mouth. So understand that the normal thing is, I'm going to teach you to go beyond that. But remember, the normal thing is, while you're feeling bad, maybe you stop praising God. Maybe you forgot who it is that's your source. So God said you got to understand Psalms, uh, uh, Psalms 103. Uh, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Watch this. And forget not all his benefits. His benefits happen to be unforgettable when I'm in trouble. So God is saying when you get in trouble, don't forget how you got where you are. How many know it was because I was thanking God when I was going through my experiences that I made it this far? I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about those those midnight, those quiet times, those desperate day moments when you had to thank God because you were in the wilderness. So let me give you a definition of what the wilderness is. Write this down so you can get with me tonight. So you can understand what I'm saying. Here's the definition of the wilderness. The wilderness is a place of emptiness. It's a place where you feel pressured. It's a place where you feel dry. It's a place where you have no joy. Uh, it seems like your, your life is not going in the direction where you wanted it to go. You get drained in the wilderness. Uh, how you get there is a certain problem just keeps on going. That's why somebody uh, can have a family problem and it can start pulling on your salvation and it can steal your ability to stay where you are while you're constantly being plagued by family problems. I'm talking about the children. I'm talking about the, the marriage situation. There, there can be something in your life that's constantly, even after a good day of work, even after a, a great time somewhere, your mind goes right back to that wilderness. Something in my life is still plaguing me. It's a place of no refreshments. You know in the wilderness it's a, it's a desert so there's no water, there's no vegetation there's nothing exciting you you don't see why you should go on as a matter of fact some people in the wilderness have to figure out a reason to go on they keep their mind busy so that they can continually trust in God. But a wilderness experience is one where you find yourself so uh, Focused in on what is wrong that you can't get back to a state of understanding what God is doing. What, what's a wilderness season? A, fi a season of bad finances. Um, uh, and, and where you're constantly trying to make sure the bills are paid. A season of constant arguments. The, the uh, OJs, I know I shouldn't go there, but y'all understand, had a song, 992 Arguments. We keep fussing and fighting. Some people are living in a house where it's constant arguments and fussing and fighting. And you keep yourself in the wilderness. Let me give you an example because the origin of the wilderness, write this down. The origin of the wilderness is with the children of Israel. Numbers 33 and 18. Numbers 33 and 8. I'm sorry, 33 and 8. They journeyed 
33 and 8. Well, the, the entire chapter of Numbers is about surviving your wilderness experience, your wilderness season. Did I tell somebody that a season does not mean it's a short time? A season can be four years, five years, six years, or six days. But you've got to learn how to survive a season. Listen to Numbers 33 and 8. They journeyed from Haharoth, passed through the midst of the sea into the wilderness. They went three days' journey in the wilderness of Ithan and camped at Myra, chapter starting point of the journeys. Now, what I mean by that is, here is the starting point in this chapter. In Numbers, they're rehearsing all of the time the children of Israel were left in the desert, were left in the wilderness. Everybody with me? That whole chapter, when you go through, you'll see all kinds of starting points. I just took you to verse 8, which was another starting point. Each one of those starting points makes the 40 years they were in the wilderness. 40 years? Do you realize you can be a believer and be 40 years with your life upside down? You can be a believer and be 40 years with stuff so messed up you won't even enjoy the walk that you're on. So, but we need to understand not only is it a time when, you know, God tells you the wilderness is an example or the origin was the children of Israel. It always follows, this is an important point, I think it's on your notes, your handout. It always follows a mountaintop experience. You want to write something on your paper right now? Guard yourself when things look good. It's the moment things look good that you got to know right after the mountain may be coming a good time for God to take you to the next level of your life by sending you into a wilderness experience. Remember, Jesus Christ had just come off the mountain of being baptized by John the Baptist, his forerunner. And in that third chapter, he said, uh, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The next verse said he sent him to the wilderness. Why? Because there's something about the wilderness that I'm going to teach you that's going to bless you as we get there. But I got to do this because some people, I, I got to make sure you have a thorough understanding of this teaching. So I want you to know the wilderness is not suffering only. When I talk talking about wilderness, and I was writing this and the Lord told me, make sure they understand the wilderness is not suffering. They think the wilderness is only about suffering. There's suffering in the wilderness, but that's not what the wilderness is about. That's not the purpose of the wilderness. Matter of fact, I'm going to throw some bonus in here and let you know why you suffer. That might help somebody. I want you to know why God lets us suffer. Now, I'm not going to give you the stuff other folks give you. Most folks tell you stuff like this, which is all wrong. They tell you, you just need to believe more. You got to pray more. You don't have enough faith. You're suffering because you don't have enough faith. You're suffering because you sinned. If that was the case, there wouldn't be too many of us not suffering, period. Because all of us have found ourselves there. And then they give you the biggest lie now in what I call this easy religion. True believers don't suffer. If you get that mess in your mind, you're going to be jacked up always. As soon as you believe I'm not supposed to suffer, you put yourself in a position where the suffering is magnified. I don't know why we fall for something that says we're not supposed to suffer when God is a God that from the beginning of time, God did not mince his words. God was serious about what he's doing. We're the ones created this nice religion. God didn't have that. If I can take you back, watch this. From the beginning of time, God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden. That sounds like a nice God to you? God said, when things ain't right, I'm going to take care of them. And that's going to lead to suffering. Adam and Eve suffered. Think about something. When the people didn't do right in the world, in Genesis, God destroyed the world and only saved Noah. Where do you get this stuff from that believers aren't supposed to suffer? And then you get into this New Testament stuff. Somebody says, well, that's the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. Don't ever fall for that. All of your Bible is affecting you. And the reality is about that is, don't ever think I'm not supposed to suffer. Ooh, I'm helping somebody right here. That will make you suffer more. Because you'll sit around and you'll find yourself psychologically drained while you're trying to figure out why all this mess happened to you. Why not? Did it, why not you? It happens to everybody. Will anybody fool you? But here's the reasons why God allows us to suffer. Write this down. It helps you. First reason is Romans 8.18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy compared to the glory that is to be revealed in us. 
Listen to me. Every time you suffer, you get closer to the glory of God. Because when you get them suffering, and you're still here, and you're still trusting God, and you're still believing God, you know what you just did? You just slid a little closer to God. And many of us who suffer know what I'm talking about. Illness, trouble in our lives, family problems, health problems. All I say is, once you suffer and you get close to God a little more, God's glory rubs off in your life. And when the glory rubs off in your life, you get to, you get to be those kind of people that say, I can't stop worshiping God. I told somebody, when the pandemic hit, I was talking to a couple of pastoral friends of mine. You know, a lot of churches, I told them we were getting ready to go back to in-person Bible study. And they told me, well, a lot of my friends, the pastor told me, a lot of my friends, other pastors said, their people haven't come back yet. You know why people haven't come back? Because they haven't seen the glory of God. They haven't, they haven't hungered for that glory. What am I talking about? When you suffer enough that you sure enough have been confronted in the face of God, how many have seen God alone? Not in church, not with other people, but you've seen God in your house. You met God. How many have been desperate for God and found yourself in a place where the tears were coming down and you had to cry until you heard from God? How many believers know the real deal is there's a whole lot of days I am scared to death if I don't have God in my life? And when you do that, nobody's going to tell you to come back to church. Nobody's going to tell you to try to find God. How many of you know I'm looking for God every day? And if you don't find Him, that's on you. Because the reality is, the glory of God is revealed. So what I said to him was, people who haven't come back, there's three categories. It's the Duncan's version, but I believe it's true. The first thing is, first they were just habitual churchgoers. They were in a habit of going to church. They wanted everything, but they had a habit. They were paying their tithes, they were coming to church, they had a habit of going to church. And so, when the pandemic hit, that whole year sent them in the way of another habit. That habit now, it, nothing wrong with us going virtual, but now they're sitting home. Now they're sitting home and they're comfortable and they can't break the habit of getting back. Come on, I know somebody feel what I'm talking about. You might have been doing something that was habitual to you and then all of a sudden something came up. Maybe somebody got sick and you got out of the habit. It's hard to get back to what I was doing before I left what I was doing. Because habits come like that. The second group, I call them the group who, sure enough, are serving God. They had a relationship. That's the second group. And that's the main group. Those who had a relationship with God. We were sitting around saying, be glad when this pandemic over. And then there's another group that was so messed up, they had to come back. Are y'all with me? Some people's lives got so messed up that they had to, so messed up that they had to find God. And that's the difference. So first of all, we get God's glory in our life. Don't take God's glory lightly. Everybody doesn't get it. Secondly, 1 Peter 5 and 10. And after, I'm talking about why you suffer, and I'm telling you suffering is not like the wilderness, but I'm telling you why you suffer, so when you suffer, you don't go through suffering wrong. After you suffer, have suffered a while, the God of all grace, who has called you to eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I declare, 1 Peter 5 and 10, somebody is living. Won't God, no matter how far down you go, can't God bring you back? No matter how bad the situation is, can't God get you settled again where you've got a, you know, got a little decent, like that old folks say, I'm sitting here with a little piece of my mind, right? Uh, with, with, a, with a good portion of my mind. Somehow God can bring us back from the worst tragedy and bring us to a place because of his word. And because I suffered through something, it gives me joy now to know that when I'm suffering, God is strengthening me. That's the second reason. Write it down. God's glory is the first reason. First Peter says God strengthens us. He restores us. He, confront, he confirms us, strengthens us, and establishes us. Don't miss the establish. Once God strengthens you, he establishes you for the next thing you've got to go through. Lastly, what suffering does. I could give you a whole lot. I'm only going to give you three. And that is to teach us endurance. Write it down. Some of us have been holding on for a long time and are not tired of thanking God yet. There's some of us have been holding on for a long time. and don't get to the place where we're tired of thanking God. Romans 5 and 3. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. What produces endurance? Suffering. 
Not good days? No, suffering. What produces endurance? When I had to call on God and he became real. Suffering made me know I can get through some other stuff. Come on, somebody. Suffering told me I can make it through this thing because I've already been through something else. So, you got a pretty good idea that suffering is different from the wilderness, but you still don't know what the wilderness is, and that's why I'm trying to clarify it. I'll say that again. You understand when I told you the definition of the wilderness, because we've all been there. But I wanted you to know the wilderness is not suffering, because you've got to separate that. Because when you see what the wilderness is for, I'm getting ready to open your eyes to a revelation that will show you why you are still standing. Because the wilderness is that essential in the life of a believer. Here's what it says. All that you've seen, all that you've been through, the reason you should rejoice in the wilderness, because the wilderness is for one reason only. Write it down. When God drives us to the wilderness, you will see in the text that we read as we go through that text. God drives us into the wilderness so he can lead us into our calling through understanding his heart. He leads us into our calling. The wilderness is only for one purpose, so you can fulfill what you've been called to do. That's why I tell people, don't tell me you've been going to church watching television. That's right, I'm saying it. Because when you're watching television, you might be able to say amen, even if you're watching me tonight. I'm not talking to y'all who you know you're tithing and you're giving and you can't get out because you're sick. But remember, the only thing that we're going to have when we get the glory for God to say well done with is the gift he gave us to use and did we use it? That's the only thing you got. You can't use your gift in your tongue. You can't use your gift in your house. You can't use your gift looking around. God said, I need you to come back to church because I got a greater need when the world is leaving God. Many of us know the work that we do is what makes us who we are. I'm not who I am because I'm a pastor, but I'm a pastor because of who I am. So you need to understand, you can't walk away from your calling. That's why you're still doing what you're doing. There's some of you in here, you've been ushering so long, your feet hurt, you don't even want to usher no more. But that's your calling. Some of you in here, it hurts you to go to the pantry. You can't even lift one box, and you done lift 17. Why did you do it? Because that's your calling. When you see those people getting fed, when you see something change in life, those are the things that make it your calling. And even if you try to run from your calling, you shouldn't because that's what the wilderness does. Here's the revelation. The wilderness is your prosperity. It is because of the wilderness that, look, I read Matthew 4, 1 and 2, right? And as soon as Jesus got baptized, God led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Why did he have to do it? The same reason he got to take you and me to the wilderness is because we're nothing without our wilderness experiences. You can't tell me how good you are if you have never, never been to a point that things have been bad in your life. You can't tell me um, how good a marriage you got if you haven't had a marriage where y'all had some real heart-to-heart -heart struggles in your life. You can't tell me how good your relationship with your, with your children are if you haven't had milestones at every place where you had to get with them and learn them and relearn. You know what I'm talking about? From the, from the young kid age to now them becoming an adult and then they got to the point where they knew more than you and now they're adults so you got to figure out how to deal with them. All that stuff is real. And you can't tell me what you know till you've been through something to tell me what you know. Jesus couldn't tell me he could be my savior if he ain't never been hungry. He couldn't tell me he could be our savior if he had never been tempted. How are you going to tell me who you are or try to walk in somebody else's shoes if you've never seen what they've been through? The wilderness is to give us, I'm going to give you three things, I'm going to blow your mind, I'm going to say it slow so you can write it down. Because I want you to see this. All of us know this. I just told you, God is not a nice person. God really been wilding out since he got on the scene. God does not play with holiness. God does not play with what he wants you to be. When God sees something, God attacks it. We the one that created this nice gospel have pushed God out of church and made the church so crazy and so weak that people won't stand on the things they need to stand on. How do we do it? Because we didn't understand the reality of the wilderness and we were compelled in the wilderness. You're compelled to get closer to God and learn this is all I got to live with. It's all I got to do. I wish I would try to leave God. 
What am I talking about? Write this down. The wilderness gives us three things that are going to be the three points we're going to look at this text for. The first one is, listen to this terminology. We break free from the myth of the sufficiency, I know it's going to be hard, so I'm going to say it several times, of logic, success, and what we think truth is. I'm going to break it down. We break free from the myth of thinking we are sufficient enough to handle life. And this is what success means. This is logical. See, God said, until you suffer, you can't ever walk in the supernatural because you're dependent on logic. And when you tell me that's not reasonable, that's why you'll never get a mirror. If God tells you, think about something. God says, speak to the mountain, tell it to move, and whatsoever you say, you can have. That's not reasonable. But if you go to the wilderness, I bet you'll start speaking to some mountain. When, when all the other options go out, if you go to the doctor and the doctor said nothing else we can do, how many know? You may not have believed in healing, but I bet you'll call for some prayer then. This is what I'm saying. See, some, some of us guys don't understand. God said, I got to take you in the wilderness because you were born again by biologically and by blood, but then you were born again spiritually. But you can't walk in that spirit till I take you somewhere where you get out of the logic of your physical. In the, in the physical, it tells you this ain't going to work. So you will never be able to get the things you need from God until you suffer. And once you suffer, you know what'll happen? Somebody will tell you what God can't do, and you won't even listen to him. Because you change your normal to a new normal. How many know right now that I don't care how bad my finances get, my God is able to supply my needs? How'd you learn that? How'd you learn? You didn't learn it when you had a cover full of food. You didn't learn it when your bank account was full. How many know bank account has been empty? Didn't have any other sources. But how many know God was my source? As a matter of fact, the psalmist said, I lift my eyes to the hills from which cometh my help. Anybody know God is real? So sometimes you, when you go to the wilderness, when you come back, you know that that God that you're dealing with is a real God. So if I go home right now and the car breaks down, both of them, I don't have to get to the point where I worry about it. I've learned how to pray because I've seen God take care of situations. Yeah. How did I learn that? We've been in the wilderness. We were just talking about when we were younger and we had moved into this house that my mother-in-law supplied for us. And that's all we could do. We were trying to save money for our house. Uh, you know, I told you all this story before Marcia got pregnant. Bad Marcia on the lap. Before we could get our insurance straight. And next thing we know, we got a big bill, tried, tried to get a trailer, couldn't afford a trailer. Our credit was so bad. We were living in this house where they had rats in the house that big. At night, some of y'all better, this, I should have rated this Bible study R. At night, we had rats that big trying to climb into Jennifer's crib to get her milk. I was on rat watch. <laughs> you might know what I'm talking about. See, some of y'all don't know what poor is till you've been on Red Watch. All I'm telling you is, what, what we were talking about this one day, you know what it does? It makes us appreciate what we have now. Some of y'all act like your house, when you walk up to your big house and you get in your car, you don't thank God, but every time I press that gas down, every time I see that roof over my head, I got somebody with me, every time I got money in my pocket, I thank God. But what's going on? When to buy something in my credit rating surprised me. <laughs> That's how you know you got to bless God. Anybody with me? When you bless God because if you've been through something, you can appreciate what you got. In fact, you got appreciation praise right now. Some of y'all know you can and like the song say, you done came from a long way. So the first thing is, God said, I put you in the wilderness because you're too logical. I'll never be able to get my word in you. Because you'll always be able to put it down because you think you know more than I know. Second reason he sent you to the wilderness. To help you understand the freeing or liberating, I'm going to say this slow, gospel of Jesus. The freeing gospel of Jesus. The real freedom in the gospel of Jesus is not found in domination 
but in partnership. Now spell it. Not found in domination. That means it's not found in D-O-M-I-N-A-T-I-O-N, but in partnership. Watch me. I'm going to say it again. I know you're still right. It helps you understand that the liberating gospel of Jesus is not found in dominion or non denomination, but in partnership. Domination, excuse me, but in partnership. Meaning that many of us don't realize God wants us to be a partner with him and not allow him to control our lives or we to control him. Uh, let me say it better. So, God is saying, if you're poor, you think the way to be free is to become like the rich. But God said, no. If you're poor, try to become a partner with someone else's poor. Help them, and I'll make you rich. You all you ain't got it, right? God is saying, don't be the kind of person that want to reverse the tables. It, we want to, we want, it, it's saying that strength does not come from pushing weak people away. If you're a weak person, strength doesn't come by you wanting to become strong so you can push other weak people. I hope y'all get it. See what God is saying. You are walking in a gospel, and the reason the church can't draw anybody in is because we get to the point that we think we got everything, and we don't get a partnership with God. God said, when I take you to the wilderness, I'm going to become so important that you're going to help me build my kingdom. But if I don't, you're going to take the stuff that I give you, you're going to snare it up people, you're not going to help nobody out, you're going to celebrate what you got, but you ain't going to give none away, you're going to walk around like other folks, you, you can turn your nose at other people, act like they don't deserve to be where you are, forget where you are, because that's what the gospel teaches us now. It teaches us to go out there and get our own. And God said, no, I'm going to open your heart. When I take you to the wilderness, you'll learn how to reach out and help somebody else. All I'm saying is, shouldn't it, it, it my kids tell me I cry at the craziest times. But you know what makes me cry? What makes me cry is when I see someone being misused. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody can feel that. I'm not trying to make me look like a good person. That does. If I see somebody being misused by another person, that makes me, that makes me, that makes me angry, it makes me cry. Because I feel sorry for the person who is helpless. Sometimes, guys, we got to understand that the reality of the partnership with Jesus Christ is, watch me, God so loved the world that he gave. If you're going to walk in the, with God, you got to become a partner with God. And God said, you're not thinking about partnering with me until you get in the wilderness. All you're thinking about is what can you get from me? How much can I give you? How, much can I, how many times can I heal you? What can you get? But you're not thinking about helping anybody else. So I'm going to take you to the wilderness. So you'll realize how fleeting things are. And the last thing right here is a good one. I know these are heavy. God wants you to write this down. It breaks our addiction, it breaks our addiction. Somebody said, I didn't know I was an addict. Yeah, you, you are. To thinking and feeling in a way, it breaks our addiction to thinking and feeling in a way that stops the working knowledge of God. To move in our lives. Think what I just said. I know it's a lot. I'll say it slow again. Guys, this is going to bless you. Stay with it. We're going to go over these. We're going to do these again. I just want you to know this. It breaks our addiction. Those limited ways we think and act. Of thinking and feeling. That stops the working knowledge. Of God. To move in our life. It breaks our addiction. To limited thinking. God said when I take you to the wilderness. You will no longer be limited. In what you believe I can do. Wow. He said, because you're going to see me perform a miracle while you're in the wilderness. And if I perform a miracle while you're in the wilderness, you will know that I can do anything. That's all. And, and, and now, let me, I, I can say these in another way, but I wanted you to hear how the Holy Spirit gave it to me. God said, my people think so limited. They, they, they got this. I, I can't even speak into them because they think and they feel differently than what I want them to feel in my word. So he said, you think limited. Okay, it's going to get better. So then, why does God put
put us in the wilderness. Write this down. Deuteronomy 8. Should be on your paper. Verses 2 through 3. The wilderness is not suffering. The wilderness is for our progress. The wilderness is so I can learn how to think like God, be like God, partner with God, act like God. And here is what God does in the wilderness to make that happen. Wow. Here is how God makes that happen. Some of you have been through this metamorphosis, this transformation, and don't even know you went through it. Here it is. Deuteronomy 8, verses 2 and 3. Thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness. If you look at the verse, he's going to tell you what he does while you're in the wilderness. To humble you. Isn't that what I just said? Humble you. To prove you. To know what's in your heart. Whether you'll keep my commandments or not. Here's what God said. Everybody look up for a minute because you're reading it. God said, you should rejoice because in the wilderness, I humble you. In the wilderness, I prove you or I make you real. When you get in the wilderness, uh, I, I fix your heart. I know what's in your heart. And now I'll know whether you'll keep my commandments. Then I'll know whether I can bless you. Look at the third verse. He said, and he did. He humbled us. We suffered with hunger. He fed us with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did the fathers know. God made a miracle, gave us something that had never been done before, that he might make us know that a man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. God said, I send you to the wilderness to make you a better Christian. I send you to the wilderness to answer your prayers. I send you to the wilderness to make you stronger. I send you to the wilderness because in the wilderness, that's when you'll meet your call. You have this grander idea of what you want to be for me. You got all this stuff you want to happen in your life. You want to be able to walk through the miracles. God said, well, you got to go to the wilderness first so I can perfect your calling in you. When I perfect your calling in you, your whole life changes. Some of us right now uh, never knew we would be where we are now based on what we had already been through. Isn't it something how God preserved us through some of our worst trials? Not that God preserved us through our worst trials. Isn't it something that God is still preserving us? Anybody but me living off God day by day? Anybody but me know when you wake up in the morning, I got to connect with God or I can't make it through that. Dude, you, we, look, we confront in front of people. But how many know I make sure I got God with me before I try to go through some stuff on my own? I just need somebody to understand what I'm saying. God said, and when you don't, he said, look, this wilderness thing is kind of kind of tricky because he said, I send you there to bless you, but sometimes some of the stuff you do make me send you there. So you wonder why all of a sudden, it looked like the sky fell down. All of a sudden, I've seen people have been married 35 years, divorced. Can't stand one another, get angry. It's because, watch me, there was a place where God wanted to prove them, take them through some stuff, and they weren't accommodating or cooperating with God. So when you got to this place in life, you weren't ready for the mountain you had to face. If you're not ready for the mountain you got to face, Jesus went to the wilderness. I'm going to hit that. We're going we to close with what Jesus did. And i got to show something to you. I want you to still believe this. Watch this. The desert, or this wilderness, what it does for us, it makes us tougher. It makes us use our faith. And here's the kicker. Some of us know that there's an occasion I get a chance, I got to go say, you know, James 1, you know, uh, count it all joy. You know, there's an occasion, you know, a couple weeks, maybe twice a month. Hey, but some of us know, uh-uh, that's my life. I got to count it all joy every day. Anybody with me? Some of us aren't just trying to count it all joy in these special times. There's some days that I got to hold on to God, period, just to take a step. So, God is saying, I sent you to the wilderness so I can build you up so you can handle that. Look at Joshua and Caleb. Um, they were survivors of the 40-year journey in the wilderness because they believed God. Joshua believed God, 
finished up his calling. He was to follow Moses. Some of us don't realize, all you really got, I don't care how many kids you got, I don't care how many cars you got, I don't care what your house is, when you get to eternity, all you really got is, did I do what God called me to do? Did I fulfill my calling? That's the most paramount, important thing in God's life. Did I do that? As strenuous and painstaking as it was, did I do it? Caleb, 85, still asked for his mountain. Let me give you some examples of what I want you to write these names down so you can feast on this before I tell you what Jesus did as we close. Watch this. David spent time in caves, hideouts. David, hiding from Saul. Wait a minute, he was King David. He killed the lion. Yeah, but y'all forgot about his wilderness. He spent a whole lot of his life running from Saul after his mountaintop experience. That's what I want you to see. Don't be shocked by the wilderness coming after the mountaintop because that's when the wilderness comes, but that's when you're supposed to be strong enough to handle the wilderness. David ran around. Much of the book of Psalms, if you read it, is about David telling you how he suffered in his wilderness. So we can learn how to suffer in ours. Psalms will help us out, won't it? Yeah. Because the Psalms can comfort us once we know it. Elisha was another person. Think about Elisha. Prophet of God got to the point in the wilderness where he wanted to kill himself, but God encouraged him. But he spent a whole lot of his life running in the wilderness, trying to run away from his call. Abraham. He was in Ur of Chaldees. Write the names down. You can read these later. Abraham found himself... Nobody was living holy but him. God came along and said, I want you to think about this. I want you to leave. I'm not going to tell you where you're going, but I want you to leave everything you know. How many of us would have done that? That's what I'm trying to say. God, we think this is a nice gospel. It's not nice. That's why you can't handle the wilderness, because you think every day is supposed to be this nice nice day. No, it's supposed to be power enough for you to get through stuff. Right? Think about what I'm saying. Um, in the wilderness, Abraham lied about his wife. His wife laughed when God told her about the miracle. I believe the reason the promise took 20 years was because along the way, they had those bumps in the road. I'm going to tell somebody something that I know God blesses us through. But remember, there is an action and a reaction for everything we do. Sometimes that reaction gets covered in grace, but don't think we get away with stuff. What am I saying? Abraham wanted to make Ishmael his heir. Then all of a sudden, well, his wife said, go sleep with your concubine. Of course he didn't want to do that. <laughs> so he had to convince him to do that. So he went step with his concubine. That just brought more trouble. What am I trying to say? When you do your thing in the middle of God's thing, it's going to bring some things your way that you've got to figure out. Right? Moses in the wilderness, 40 years a prince, 40 years, he was smelling sheep. But at the end of that 40 years, prosperity came. Here's the good news with all of this. The wilderness is a place of prosperity because in it, God is taking us to the things he has for us. And the things God has for us is better than the things we have for ourselves. Amen. Oh, somebody better hear what I just said. How many know God still got some more for you? How many, anybody in the wilderness right now that believe this wilderness is not the end of everything? That's my good news to you tonight. This wilderness is not your end. Because when God is in control of the wilderness, there's prosperity at the end of the wilderness. I need somebody to thank God for his prosperity that's coming at the end of your wilderness. How many believe that even though it's bad now, this is not over? Here it is. It's going to make
be strong. But Jesus is giving us an example of how to handle the wilderness. Look at it. Jesus was led, verse 2, by the Spirit of God to be tempted of the devil so he could become our Savior. Wow. You were led in your wilderness so you could become somebody's Savior. Somebody heard your testimony. Somebody you spoke into their life. And when you stop speaking into their life, that's when you miss your call. And it may not look like it's doing any good until God uses you. So the first thing. So the first thing was the first temptation is in the area of provision. That was the first thing I just told you. Sufficiency. Remember I gave you that? God said, look, uh, I want to make sure you're not so logical I can't give you something supernatural. So know what he did? Look what Jesus said. Satan said, it is written. Well, Jesus said, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Satan told him to turn the stones into bread. Turn the stones into bread. Now watch this. Satan was using the logic. You're the son of God. Turn the stones into bread. It's better than starving. Jesus went to the supernatural. No, I'll wait till God provides. Did somebody guess that? Mm -hmm. I'll wait till God. I won't worry. I won't fall apart. I won't sit there. I'll wait till God provides. You will get through more things by waiting on God to provide. Somebody, I'm speaking a word to somebody looking tonight. God is saying, okay, it looks like a wilderness experience. Rejoice, because prosperity is coming, but I'm going to provide. If you don't try to provide for yourself, I will provide for you. I had this old, this guy in my neighborhood, he's a skinny uh, gentleman. Looked like his legs get ready to fall apart. He walks every day. Sometimes he walks with a cane. Walks with a stick, but he walks every day. And I remember going out, doing my walk one day, seeing this guy. I thought, I said, man, this man must be a, a strong somebody, even though he didn't look like it. And he stopped me one day and was talking to me. Guess what I found out? He said, as we were passing each other, I said, wow, man, I see you walking every day. What, what's going on? He said, oh, no, um, I was an attorney in the service, armed forces. He said, but then I went out into the field, and when I did, I got a mortar wound in my head, concussion, in a coma. They sent me home, but they gave me an honorable discharge because I couldn't fight anymore. He said, but then I had several strokes, and I had heart attacks. Then I got cancer, and had cancer surgery. He said, but I keep walking every day because all of those things I've been through makes me appreciate being able to walk. Yeah. I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. So instead of complaining about it, somebody ought to celebrate all the things you've been through. If you can still lift an arm, if you can still lift a leg, if you can still think straight, you ought to celebrate. See, the devil be whispering in your ear, look at all that mess going in your life. No, what you ought to celebrate is, ah, he still said, a lot of my friends who are healthy are dead. I'm still here. But you know what I do? I keep walking. Every, how many know I just keep walking? Anybody here know some days I just keep walking? I ain't got nothing else going on. I don't feel good when I get up. I grab God and I just keep walking as far as I can walk and do all I can do. I hope y'all hear me because there's some days in my life when I know all I got is I better get up out that bed and make sure I keep living so the devil don't steal what little life I got left. You can't do nothing but make toast. Make some toast. I'm telling you. Devil can't stop you if you do something. Jesus said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word comes out of the mouth of God. He'll keep us in his service. We understand he is our provision. So I can keep going. Look at the second temptation. I'm, I'm reading from the scripture so you know what it is. The devil, um, excuse me, 
And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the son of God, command the stone to be bread. Then the devil taketh him unto the holy city, verse 5, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He will give his angels charge over thee concerning this, concerning thee, and in their hands they shall lift thee up. Jesus said, It is written, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Second temptation goes to the second thing, second point that I gave you. The real liberation of the gospel is when you partner with God. You tell the devil, I'm not going to tempt God. I'm going to serve with God. I'm not going to fall for your temptation so God is embarrassed by my life. Can I tell somebody this? The temptation is not worth the consequence. Because if you stay with God, somehow he'll do a miracle that takes you further than you would have been if you had not stayed with him. I believe some people have not been caught because God smoothed some things over because he had love for you. I believe some of us have had some provisions that we didn't deserve. And if we looked on somebody else's life, we see that their life was hurting, and somehow God kept me. I had a friend of mine just died. It, it, it shocked, you know, death shouldn't shock you, but that man was in great shape. Here I am, still here. Many of you know, you can be sick and almost dead. Other folk can be vibrantly healthy, and you're still here. Don't you ever forget that God is your source. God is your source. So what do you say? I'm not going to tell God. I'm going to partner with God. Every day when I get up, I'm going to try to speak the gospel. I'm going to go to my church and I'm going to do some work. I'm going to read my word. I'm going to fill it in me. I'm going to try to do something that lets God know I'm still on his side. When you don't, oh, I feel it right now. Shut up, devil. When you don't, what good is your living if you're not trying to use what God gave you? And when we only use it on our terms, we never go to a higher place of glory. We're the real folk that'll tell you, many, many, many days, I don't feel like it. Anybody with me? I press. I do it because God wants me to do it. So all God is saying is, Jesus said, when you get in your wilderness, the second thing is, don't fall for the devil's temptation to tempt God. Don't go for the quick buck. Don't go for the easy way out. Hang in there with God and watch God bless you through what you're going through. Let me get real for you for a minute. All of us have had problems with our children, problems with our health, problems with our mind. Amen, somebody, man. Problems, you know, I know uh, even if you got a whole lot of money, you still had some money problems. Things happen in our life. But isn't it good to know that when they happen and I look back over my where my feet were walking, I did not walk out of God's will on purpose. When you can look back and say, God, there was a moment I was really tempted, but I hung in there and I didn't do it. That's such a blessed moment, you don't know. Because everything in us wants to give in and do it. I know y'all sitting there looking at me like y'all are all holy and stuff. You're not fooling me. All of us. I don't know what your particular poison is. But whatever it is, if they tip to Jesus, don't make me think they can't tip you. And if the devil went after Jesus, he sure is going after you. Do you know what the devil does to some of us? He makes us so unfriendly and so repulsed by other people that they can't see God in us. And so when they can't see God in us, they move a little further away from God. I sometimes, uh, me and Marcia went by this Annie's house yesterday. Y'all got to pray for Marcia. Marcia just want to kiss everybody, sit on everybody's bed. Hug everybody. We sitting in there, Annie and Annie and Marlon. So good to see you. I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> but that's that's her calling. 
So what I'm saying is we sat in there, Annie was so excited that we came by to have prayer with her. I'm only mentioning that because how excited would somebody be if you changed up and just went to see them? How excited would they be? We, we have a lady in our church in Bonham that just uh, lost. She's a Jamaican lady. I don't know who she is, but I found out that her mother died. Um, you know, she, oh, you're here. That's you. God bless you. Come on, get stand up for me, honey. What is your name? Now I see you face. And now I know you. Take the mask off. Face who you are. Oh, my God. Yeah, I know who you are. She goes all the time. Well, I, I called her because when I heard mother, y'all know I got a fresh wound. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. So I was not going to let a time go by that I would not call her about her mother. Amen. And I hope it encouraged you, honey, for, for me to call you. Amen. But I did that because I know how I felt when somebody called and encouraged me. Don't take it lightly that you can bless somebody else's life. That's the partnership. That's where the strength comes from. Not in dominating with your title and with how many, you know, how, how faithful you are and bragging about what you do. That's nothing to God. What God says, can you bow down and help somebody? Last point. I know we gotta get out of here. Come on, last point. Here it is. And the third point that comes, we break our addiction. Look at it. The last area of Jesus' temptation concerned the worship of God and him only. Jesus replied to Satan, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou worship. I'm talking about why you're in the wilderness. In the wilderness, don't get so messed up that you begin to worship other stuff because you're hurting. The children of Israel, when Moses went to get the tablets, they decided to build a golden calf, saying these are the gods that delivered us. And because of that, they got severe consequences in the Old Testament. They were all stricken down. Matter of fact, God came back, told Moses, find out who's on the Lord's side. I don't know about y'all, but I'd have been in that group that got saved. Because I would have been on the Lord's side. Y'all can make all the gold y'all want. I'd have been hiding somewhere, eating my, whatever they was eating back then. In a corner, waiting on Moses to come back. What I'm saying is, learn to wait on God. Don't, don't fall off your worship because things aren't going well. I, I just want to bless you with something so you know where we're going. Write down Isaiah 43, 17, 19. Next week, the second installment in this lesson on why God sends us to the wilderness, we're going to talk about how God makes things new once you get in the wilderness. Somebody's looking for something new. It's going to bless you. You won't be here. You don't want to miss it. God said, it's only in the wilderness I can make some new stuff out of old stuff. So you want to be here to catch that? Let's give God a praise tonight. Um, those of you that are real thanks for joining us, share and, you know, tag, share, let somebody else like this, share it with somebody else. Thank you for joining us. Please go to our website, www.shilohbaptistchurches, and you can push the give button and give to the ministry. And those of you here tonight, you don't have to give, but there'll be a big bucket at the door calling your name. So just make sure you answer when it calls. Let's give God a hand of praise tonight. Thank you. God bless you. And guys, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you to do one thing. Encourage some more folks to come to Bible study. These are going to be life-changing teachings. I'm trying to do, teach stuff that is relevant to the walk that we're having now. And all of us will find ourselves in the world, right? I'm going to bring, I just look at those three points. You guys know that I, I, I teach a seminary. I think my three points were a little too heavy. I'm, I'm going to break them down. <laughs>